Hello, everybody, and welcome back to BioSC 140 Human Physiology. This video is going to cover Laboratory 23, the white blood cell discussion video. Now, I'm going to assume you've already watched the experimental procedure video. Remember, I do ask questions regarding the experimental procedures. Knowing how to do the experiment helps you understand the material and helps you get the points on the quiz. So definitely review that if you haven't so far. All right, so the main differences between a total white cell count and a red cell count when it comes to performing it. The squares that you count are different. When you look through the microscope at the hemocytometer, sometimes it can be tough to orient where you are on the hemocytometer. Um, it looks different depending on what your magnification is. It's just, it's really easy to get lost on this graph when you can only see, you know, what the red dot covers. When you can only see what the red dot covers right there. So that's actually probably one of the hardest parts of this experiment is getting oriented on the hemocytometer. All right, so white blood cells, we're counting this big box here, this shaded in region, this shaded in region here, this shaded in region here, this shaded in region here. We are then going to multiply by 50 to adjust for dilution and volume. That will give us our total white blood cell count in thousands. I want you to know the typical range. Typical range for white blood cells is 5,000 to 10,000 per microliter. I want you to know also a little bit of pathology. What could it mean? if that number is not between 5,000 and 10,000. So when you see penia, means too few, not enough. So leukopenia, not enough white blood cells. So less than 5,000 blood cells. So if, if I told you, you know, I had you do this math, I told you, you know, you counted X number of white cells in A, X number of white cells in B, X number of white cells in C, and X number of white cells in D. Um, how, what was the total uh, white cell count for this, this student? You know, you could do the math, multiply, add them up, multiply it by 50. And it came out to 4,000 per microliter. I could ask the question on the quiz, what is the terminology used to describe this? So leukopenia, less than 5,000. Applied knowledge. This is never a good thing. Having leukopenia is never a good thing. It's always pathological, always pathological. It means that the person is immunocompromised. They don't have a strong enough immune system. Their immune system is not of normal strength if they have leukopenia. It is not a good thing. What if the patient, the student, has 17,000, 16,000 white blood cells per microliter? Well, then we would see leukocytosis. Cytosis means more. More white cells than expected. More than 10,000 white cells. This could be a good thing or it could be a bad thing. It could be a good thing if that patient has an, or student has an infection and their body is fighting that infection. Now, if you have an infection, if you have a cold, you want your body to react, right? Your body will respond by increasing the number of white cells, by making more white cells. And that's a good thing. It helps you fight off that cold. One semester, I had a student, we did this lab on Tuesday, and everybody got normal numbers between 5,000 and 10,000, but this one student, you know, was like, Professor Sitzman, I got 17,000. I was like, oh. He's like, what does that mean? You know, I, you know, I was like, wait for discussion. You know, I went over the discussion and everything. So we, you know, we knew what was going on. And I always tell students, you know, we're not diagnosing anybody. We're not diagnosing anything in lab. There's a lot of errors. 
in lab, you know, we're new to this, we're not professionals. So, you know, if you get a weird number, just kind of ignore it in lab. But if you feel sick, always call your doctor. You know, get that disclaimer. Well, two days later at our next class, before it, he sent me an email saying that he was sick and that he had to miss class. So his body, I'm assuming, had started ramping up the number of white blood cells uh, before he even started feeling the symptoms of, of being sick and he missed class the next day. So if you have leukocytosis, if you have you know, more than 10,000 white blood cells per microliter because you have an infection, good, your body's fighting that infection. If you have it because you have leukemia, because you have a cancer that's producing white blood cells uncontrolled, so when you have leukemia, you, you, you pro if you have a cancer, some cancers will produce an incredible amount, a large amount of white cells, of unfunctional, of white cells that aren't functioning properly. And we call that leukemia. If it happens in bone marrow, we call it myeloid. And think about where white blood cells come from. White blood cells can come from the bone marrow or they can come from lymphatic tissue. If it is a myeloid cancer, you're gonna have abnormal white cell counts, but you're also gonna have abnormal thrombocytes and red blood cell counts because they also come from the bone marrow. If you only have abnormal white cell counts, it's probably a cancer, a lymphoid cancer, uh, a cancer of the lymphatic system. So white blood cells are part of our immune system. They help provide immunity. We have two main categories, your granulocytes and your agranulocytes. Granulocytes were named for their cytoplasmic granules. The name kind of makes sense. There's three subtypes. There's neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. And then for our agranulocytes, there's no cytoplasmic granules. You know, break the word down, agranule, like without granule, site cell. Uh, two subtypes, lymphocytes and monocytes. Be familiar with the basic morphological features that distinguish leukocytes. So, I'm not gonna show you a photo and expect you to know what white cell it is. I'm not gonna show you a photo, like a, a picture through a microscope and ask you to give me a differential for uh, you know, how many neutrophils are in this photo. I want you to know some basic descriptions though. You know, neutrophils, most common. There's usually 60 to 70% of total. So remember, a differential white cell count is what percentage of the whole are this type, neutrophils? You know, what percent of the whole are eosinophils? What percentage of the whole are basophils? And this is important when diagnosing patients, when trying to figure out what's going on with patients. So when somebody comes to you and they're sick, you need to figure out what's going on, and once you know what's going on, you can figure out how to help them. And knowing the white cell differential can help you figure out what's going on, so you can figure out how to help them. So neutrophils, 60 to 70%, I want you to know these numbers. Uh, they have neutral granul granules, and they have multi-lobe nuclei. Eosinophils, two to 4%, reddish granules, bilobe nucleus. A mnemonic device that can help you remember this is never let monkeys eat bananas. So never stands for neutrophil, 60 to 70%. The most common type. Lymphocytes, let, 20 to 25. The next most populous. Monkey. This is in descending order of the prevalence. White blood cells have different jobs. Neutrophils are like fast responders to bacterial infections. 
if your patient comes in and you notice that they have a large number of neutrophils, you know, it's 75, 80 percent of the white blood cells are neutrophils, and they have 15,000 white blood cells per microliter, you might think, hmm, I think this patient might have a bacterial infection. So that's an example of how knowing the differential can help you figure out what's going on with that patient in front of you. Diagnosis. All right. Well, that about wraps it up for the white blood cell discussion. If you have any questions, please reach out to me, and I'm here to help you. Take care, everybody, and I will see you in the next video.